Today, my name is Josh. It's my joy to be uh, the lead pastor at Laneway. Let's pray. Father, thanks so much for this part of your word. Please help us to hear you. We pray that by your mercy, our love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we might be pure and blameless filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. To your praise and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This week and next week, uh, I want to share with you what's on my heart for our church for the next 12 months. So uh, together we want to look forwards and imagine what we want to see as God's people here at Laneway uh, by this stage in 2023. Can you picture that with me? Now, if you just walked in today, this will be a a slightly strange experience because you're just getting to know people, you've just sat down, you've just said hello, um, and we want you to know that's great. You know, stay, come along, get to know the people you're sitting with. If you've been here for a little bit, come to my place for lunch after this for the next couple of Sundays. We'd love to get to know you. But also, I hope it's helpful for you as you cast your mind forwards, not just seeing what it is might happen here in a church, but to see bigger what God is doing in the world and how that shapes us. We want to be compelled by love. We want to be compelled by love. Now, uh, this year, um, we've grown as a church, as people have come to know Christ, as people have brought their friends here, as you have come, you've visited and so forth. Uh, Churches felt different. Uh, January this year, there was about 70 of us. Now there's around 100 or so on a Sunday. Um, If we keep growing like this, and we pray that we would, if you picture this this time next year, what would that feel like? Uh, We wouldn't fit in this room, basically. That'd be around 150 people, right? So how would you fit 150 people in here? What would you have to do? You'd have to take out the tables, you'd have to probably squish into some chairs, We'd fill up all the back space. Um, we'd be using all the classrooms at the back for the kids. That'd be exciting to see, wouldn't it? But once we hit that point, well, what happens next? Well, we've got some great options of things we could do. And this is what we're planning to do. We pray that uh, we'll send out Quan. That's the first way to open up space. Get rid of Quan. <laughs> <laughs> it's everyone's strategic plan, right? <laughs> Why would, we, why would we send out our beloved brother? Well, it was because we're sending him out to plant a new church, to reach new people with the gospel, right? We're going to send Kwan. End 2023, start 2024, sometime in there. What else are we going to do? Well, we'll need to do one of two things. Both of them good things, but hard, right? We'll need to multiply congregations here, or we'll need to move. Both good options. We need to multiply congregations here for the sake of the gospel. We need to move. Both good options, both hard, aren't they? Both bring up different challenges. Both throw up a bunch of changes. We need to be compelled by love to do that. And as you think about the distance between now and then, right? What is it that we might be doing? How is it that we might change in order for that to come about? There's the practical little things, isn't there? Like, we would have to change the way that we sit. We would miss that. But there's the other things we've talked about together. The things we want to do to love one another, right? We, would, we want to be the kind of church where people come together, turning up 15 minutes early, so that we meet the people who are new. So if, if you're walking in, you haven't met someone because you're new at church, there's someone who's here, just like if you're turning up at their house, <laughs> they got a smile on their face. They go, hey, "Look, come with me. Let me show you where the kids' program. Is. Let me let me get you a coffee. Come sit with me today." And we're not just here 15 minutes early, but we're doing that because we're driven by love for that person. And we're also the kind of people who've organised our lives so that Sunday lunch, you know, we've just always got it blocked out or as much as we can. Because I know as I walk into church, I want to meet somebody. I want to show generous hospitality. I want to go out for lunch with them or have them come over to my house. And so I'm ready for that. We want to be those kind of people. And the kind of people where church, you know, the church is kind of in three parts, right? There's what happens 
sort of nine till ten as we gather, set up, talk, pray, meet, meet each other. Then there's this organized time together as we sing and pray and sit under the word. And then we turn to one another, we, we talk more about what we've heard, we encourage each other. We want, we want to love one another in that moment where we turn from the big thing together to the facing each other on our tables where we encourage that person, where we get to know each other, where we listen, where we go, how did, how did God's word shape you today? And we pray for each other. And we do that even though, as church grows, we're not necessarily going to know those people in our table. Uh, we, or in that row next to us, in that seat. We're not necessarily going to see them at church and have another good conversation with them for a couple of weeks. Although, hopefully, we're going out for lunch in a week's time, right? We're going to be that sort of church. We're going to be a church that needs to value small groups because if we want to be people who know one another deeply and love a small group of people in many ways and, and, and are cared for and grow together in the Word, we're going to need to value that small group so that we not only join one but we come to it and we care about those people. We're going to be the kind of church that is going to need to care about the quality of things that happen together. Like, uh, for instance, if, you've, if, you've, if you know Sarah and I for years, right, um, we think, just come over to our house anytime, and we will leave the place filthy for you. <laughs> you'll be stepping over toys, you'll be like scraping things off your shoes, you'll be like wishing, you, if, you've, if you've come in and taken your shoes off, you'll be going back to put them on again. You know, that, that'll be your experience. Uh, if you're kind of new to us, and it's because we love you, right? And if you're, if you're brand new, also because we love you, we're actually going to sweep the floor and, and, and put a few things out of the way. But we do that because we love you, because we're just getting to know each other, because we want to honour you and show hospitality. It's not because we don't want you to see our mess, it's because it's we care. And how, how would you know that we care if we, you know, you can't even get in through the front door? <laughs> Same way as a church, right? A small church where we all know each other deeply, like there's this familiarity that comes, right? And we don't even see our own mess. But as we grow, as we want to love each other well, and there's people walk in that, that we don't know them yet, they don't know us, uh, we do those little things, right, to love each other. And a part of that together is paying attention to the quality of what we do so that we love people well, so we honour people well, we look after people well. They know as they walk in, they're loved. And so we prepare as we serve in our teams. And we reflect on how it went. It would be that kind of church. Can you see all these little changes, big changes, things that we do to be a people who are compelled by love? Now, how is it that you and I can stay compelled by love? How is it that you and I can actually go through the small changes, like having to change the way we sit, and the big changes like sending out a brother to plant a church and multiplying congregations, how do we go through the small and the big changes? Because it costs. Change always costs. It's hard. It's hard to go through. Well, I think it's clarity. 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 That leads us to continually be compelled by love. And that's what I want you to see this morning as we press into 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want us to have great clarity so that we would be continually compelled by love. Now, this is Paul's situation. He's trying to win the Corinthians to have great clarity about people's situation in life, about Christ and his death, about the ministry that God's doing, and so the ministry that Paul is doing in the time that they're in. He wants them to have clarity about these four things, so that they too will share his view, so that they too will be compelled by love, so that they too will share in the work of the gospel. That's what he wants for them. So I want you to see this clarity with me, so that we too would be compelled by love. First, see that, have, let's have clarity together about the need we have for reconciliation with God. The need our world has to be reconciled to God. It's a need that we have because of our sin. This is the need for reconciliation. Have a look in your Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. Paul says, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's 
sins against them. Now that's the basis on which we need reconciliation. Our sins. Now what is sin? Well, sin is not just a twisting and loss of things that are good. It is that. It's not just missing a standard that God has set. It is that. It's not just breaking the laws of God. It is that as well. The heart of sin is rebellion. It's our proud self-determination to live our own way. And it makes us enemies towards God. It's not like, you know, kids grow up from dependent to independent and they live their own way, right? And that's sort of, there's sort of something appropriate about that. There's a way that we do this as people which is completely inappropriate towards God. That actually the heart of it is that we don't love Him. We don't want to be dependent upon Him. We don't want to give thanks to Him. We just want to say to God, God, let me do me, Okay. I'll live my life and I'll sort it out. And this kind of opposition towards God, this proud, self-determining opposition to live our own way, it makes us enemies towards God. Enemies. It's enemies that need to be reconciled, isn't it? In Romans chapter 5, verse 10, Paul says, If while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? But did you hear it there? It's while we were God's enemies. And have you ever had to try and reconcile with an enemy? I can think of very few people in my life that I would have ever considered an enemy. <laughs> where the relationship has been so bad, it's been so hostile, where I felt that they were an enemy. Like there's the one or two bullies in school. Have you been in that situation? But in this breakdown, right, between us and God, it's, it's not like it's an even conflict where we're both at fault. You know, like a marriage that's gone sour, something like that. A workplace, you know, you and your boss, it's just not working. A friendship that's broken. See, in almost every one of those, it's likely that you're both going to have to come. You're both going to say, hey, this is what I see. This is what I need. <laughs> and I'm sorry. <laughs> I see what I've done. That's not the kind of conflict we have with God, is it? It's not like we bring our issues and God brings his issues and we're like, I'm sorry, God. And he's like, I'm sorry, Josh. That's not going to happen. No, no, no. Because what is the heart of sin? It's our proud, willful rejection of God. It's like, God, I don't want you. I don't need you. Stay out of my life. Stay out of my business. I'll just come when I need something. Now, we're the ones who've done what's wrong here. We're, We're the cheaters. We're the selfish. We're the thankless. And the great issue with that, it's not just that it means that we've broken off our relationship with God, our Creator, but it's that our sins will be counted against us and they will be repaid. So look again in your Bibles, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, just before what we read. As Paul talks about his ministry, he says in verse 10, 5, verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for the good things done while in the body. Sorry, for the things done in, while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, have you wrestled with that? Do you have clarity about that? There is going to come a moment where you will stand before the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And God the Father has entrusted him with all judgment. And so he sees all things and he knows all things. And he will judge fairly. And then you and I will receive what is due to us, for the things we've done in this life, whether good or bad. And so you can imagine the record of your life being played out before him, can't you? Where he looks upon you and he's like, I saw that moment where you helped your neighbours start their car. And I saw that moment where you were patiently looking after your mum. I saw that moment where you said sorry. I saw that moment where you held in your anger. And I saw your whole life. And I saw your heart behind it, the motives that you had. And I also saw the outcomes and the effect of what you did. How do you think that's going to go, right? 
If we're the people who've rejected God to live our own way, if we've taken God's gift of life and breath and every good thing that we experience, but then not glorified Him as God and not given thanks to Him, if we've served ourselves, even served other false gods rather than the true living God, if we've gratified the cravings of our sinful nature, if we've gone along with the ways and the values of our society, if we have followed the lies of the devil, all those things I just said, they're the things the Bible says that we do. And we stand before God and we receive what's due to us for those things. Do you have clarity? That's where everyone must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I think the only way that I find that I can truly appreciate how much my sin is offensive to God is by seeing two things. One is what the punishment looks like that fits the crime. And the other is what the cost was to turn aside that punishment. See, what fits the crime for me, for each one of us, was God's eternal judgment and condemnation to be in hell forever. And what is the punishment that could pay for such a terrible crime? Well, only the giving of his own dear son on the cross. Friends, if we're going to be a church compelled by love, we need to have great clarity about the need that we have to be reconciled to God because of our sin. Sin is the great problem. And it's not just what we do to each other, is it? But it's what it means between us and God. It's our rebellion against God. It's the judgment to come. And so friends, do you have that clarity? Let your love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you know what is best. See each other this way. I had this moment walking back out of the weekend away. Uh, it was Monday. I was walking into school to pick up the kids. And I was just walking through the schoolyard and I just was looking at each person going, that's exactly where you stand and you stand and you stand and you stand and you stand with God. Like, Unless they're reconciled to God, that's the situation each person is in. Like if you're, if you're a person who goes for walks and you walk up and down, like you walk around the block where you are, you walk along the river where you are, don't walk by the Maribyrnong River, you'll be swimming and you'll be, you'll be out to sea in a heartbeat. But um, as you walk and you look at people, just consider them for a moment with that clarity. This is who you are as a person made by God and this is where you stand before him. And hold on to that as uncomfortable, disconcerting, painful, Difficult as that is, see people with spiritual sight so that you have clarity about them, so then you'll know what it means to love them. You'll be compelled by love. That's number one. See clearly our need for reconciliation. But number two, have great clarity about Christ's death. Great clarity about Christ's death. Christ died for our sins. If you turn to verse 18, 2 Corinthians 5 verse 18, Paul says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. That's at the heart of it, isn't it? That's what Christ's death is for. It's so that God could reconcile the world and not count people's sins against them. So how has he done that? Look at verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. These verses take us to the heart of the cross. Now, who was at the weekend away? Do you remember the heart of the cross? What are the three words we're to hold on to? I want you to call them out. Number one? Number two? Number three? Yeah. Penal, substitutionary, atonement. 
the heart of the cross. Penal, substitutionary atonement. What does it mean that that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us? Well, God's provided the image of this for us in the Old Testament through the sacrificial system. Sarah, test your throwing skills. Can you throw me, throw me a little lamb? Here it comes. Oh, I give her a clap. <laughs> give her a clap. We practice our throwing where we try and throw things up and down the stairs so we don't have to walk. <laughs> right, so in the Old Testament, um, God showed us what it's going to mean for Christ to come and die for our sins by providing a model that would take away sin and make atonement. Atonements where people who are enemies, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it's it's a means of reconciling us to God, to make us at one again. So you can read about this, say, in Leviticus chapter 4, where if different people sinned, what would they do to be atoned, to be forgiven and right with God, at one with God again? Well, if an Israelite sinned and realized their guilt, they would bring a goat. This is a lamb, but let's imagine it's a goat, not a screaming goat. And um, they'd bring a goat. It had to be a goat without defects. And what they would do is, as they brought the goat up to the temple, they would stand before the altar with the priest present, and they would lay their hand on the head of the goat, and then it would be slaughtered. And the priest would mark the altar with its blood. Then the fat of the lamb would be taken and offered as a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And Leviticus 4 says, In this way the priest will make atonement for their sins, and they'll be forgiven. Do you see what's happening in that moment? So the person standing there, I think our precious little lamby again, and their, their sins are being placed on the head of the, of the goat. And the punishment that is due for their sin is being taken by the the goat in their place. And by the shedding of the goat's blood, it dies in their place so that they walk away forgiven and at one with God. Now that's what it means for Jesus to die. That's what it means for Jesus to be made a sin offering, to be sin for us. Our sins placed on him so that he dies under the wrath of God and takes our punishment upon the cross, and we're forgiven. It's an extraordinary exchange, isn't it? Our sin's not counted against us. But it's not just that it's like we're taken back to a morally neutral point. There's another half to the exchange. Do you see that 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21? God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's as if not only that we've laid our hands on the head of Christ and he's died for our sins, but he's laid his hand on our head and given us his righteousness, the righteousness of God, so that when God looks at us, it's like we're clothed in everything that belongs to Christ, all of his perfect obedience, his spotless life, his innocence, his sinlessness. It's like Christ puts his hand on our head and that's what is counted to us. Do you see the cross of Christ? Do you see why he died? And it's a union that's powerfully effective. So so what happens to Jesus counts as happening to us. He died and therefore we died. He rose from the dead and therefore we have risen to life as a new creation. It's glorious. Look look at uh, verse 14. Look at verse 14 in your Bibles. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all. And therefore, all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Do you see how powerfully Christ's death affects people? I love Colin's illustration from our weekend away about our union with Christ. Do you remember it? The picture of going swimming with his boys. 
I loved it because I was like, that's exactly what happens when I go to the pool. <laughs> so I go into the deep end of the pool with Annie and Gil, and especially before they could swim on their own, they would wrap their arms around my neck, and I would dive under the water. And they would come under the water with me. And then I would eventually pop out of the water, <laughs> and they'd pop out of the water with me. Friends, if, if you are one of Jesus' people, you two have been united with Christ. It's like your arms are around his neck. You've gone under to die with him as he died. You've come out again to rise as he rises. So that right now, you've been born anew on the inside. And when he returns, you will rise to everlasting life with a glorious, immortal body like his. Not only are you alive, but Christ has turned you around. So you're no longer living for yourself in rebellion against God. Do you see what he says? You now live for him who died for you and was raised again. Verse 15. Friends, do you see that the death of Christ is powerful and effective? All those Christ died for died. Who is the all in this passage? Well, The next sentence shows the all for whom Christ died are also those that live for him. And so it's not every person everywhere that's the all in this passage, but it's those united to Christ, those who receive the benefits of his death. That is, it's all God's chosen people, all the people he has given to his son. Now, Jesus' death doesn't just make it possible for people to be saved. Jesus' death actually effectively saves. Now this gives us tremendous confidence. Jesus will save his people from their sins. And here is the particular, the special love of Christ for his people. He died for them. He's the good shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. He's the bridegroom who gave up his life for his bride, the church. He's the king and lamb who purchased people for God with his blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. That gives us great confidence. As we go out and proclaim the gospel, we're preaching the gospel to people for whom Christ died. We don't have to fear that no one's going to respond. <laughs> we don't have to wonder if we're, you know, we're getting in the way. We can be confident that Christ has died for his people and his death is effective so that all those who are appointed for eternal life will believe. Have great clarity about the death of Christ. Because as you do, you'll have great confidence in what he achieves. Here's the third thing. Have great clarity about God's ministry. That God gives the ministry of reconciliation through Christ to his ambassadors. He gives this ministry of reconciliation through Christ to his ambassadors. You see the center of this passage in verses 18 to 20. Paul says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he's committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. First in this verse, do you see the, the source of this ministry? This ministry, this this act, this service of God. Verse 18, all this is from God. The movement to reconcile starts with him. He's the offended one. He's the one who's been rejected, and it all starts with him. It's a movement that starts with him, and it brings us back to him. It's an appeal that comes from him. And the commitment of this message of reconciliation is done by him to ambassadors of his All this is from God. So you see the mediator of this ministry. Everything is through Christ. 
It's from God, it's through Christ. Verse 18, God reconciles us to himself through Christ. Verse 19, God is reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. We implore you on Christ's behalf, all through Christ. So do you see the ambassadors of this ministry? Verse 18, Paul says, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And he says it again, verse 19, again, verse 20. Now in the first place, that's Paul and the apostles but it's not limited to them. The us, I think, in this passage refers to the ones who are writing to the Corinthians, which is Paul and Timothy, the first sentence of this letter. It's a message that passes from ambassador to ambassador, from Christian to Christian. And Paul's writing these things to the Corinthian church so that they will have this clarity and they too will share in this ministry. He wants them to take up the role of being ambassadors for Christ. And fourth, do you see the scope of God's ministry, reconciliation? In verse 19, it's the world. God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting people's sins against them. As we read at the start of church, and as we sang with joy, the Bible speaks of God's love for the world. All people without distinction, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Or well, 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says it similarly, that Christ's death is not just effective for his people, but sufficient for the sins of the whole world. He is the atoning sacrifice, John writes, the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. God in his love loves the world and loves the world to hold out the invitation of the gospel. He commands all people everywhere to repent. And so the love of Christ compels us. His love for his people and their sins. His love for the whole world that he would call all to repent. And so I want to ask you, are you clear about this? Do you have clarity about the people that you see and who you are, about the death of Jesus and about the ministry of God to reconcile the world? If we keep that clarity, friends, we'll actually move to, be sh- to share the love of Christ. Now, I remember uh, growing up with my mum, she was constantly trying to help me to love Costello cheese. It was like a minor mission of hers. Costello cheese, it's like, sort of like a breeze, sort of like a camembert. Any Costello lovers out there? All right, we'll, we'll work on this together. We're going to be compelling by love. She wanted me to adopt her view of Costello cheese, and so she'd put it out in front of me, she'd talk to me about how good it was, she'd, you know, bribe me to eat it by giving me a lolly. She wanted me to share in her view of this thing so that we could enjoy it together. It's a very smelly cheese, in case you're wondering. If if you're going to be compelled by the love of Christ, right, you, you need to actually move to kind of sit with Christ to see the world as he sees it. So that his sight of people, so that his view of God, so that his understanding of what is to come, the judgment that's to come, that will be your view of life. So that you actually share his heart then. Because Paul says it's Christ's love that compels us. You know, his love for his people where he laid down his life. His love for the world that calls all people to repent. His atoning death. He did this because of how he saw the world. Christ, who is very God and man. You have to actually be captured by this, because that's what Paul is captured by. Paul is trying to move the Corinthians to share this view. He's saying, come with me, see it with me. Do you see what people's need is? It's their sins, forgiven, reconciled to God, where they are counted righteous in God's sight by the death of Christ. Do you see that? Do you see the power of Christ's death? Do you see the ministry that God has to call people through this message 
Come and share this view with me, Corinthians, so that you too will be compelled by love, the same love that Christ has. And I think in verse 14 where he says, Christ's love compels us, it's one of those strange little phrases in the Bible where it's the love of Christ. And so that can mean the love of Christ. It can mean Christ's own love you know, for us. It can also mean love for Christ. It's one of those little ambiguities that I think makes you read back over it a couple of times to go, oh, what is that saying? And I think it's right, it's Christ's love. But just as you reflect on that for a moment, you go, but man, don't, don't we love Christ? <laughs> and can't you imagine, Paul is like, absolutely. Have you just heard all the things I've said about Christ? About God the Father? Christ who willingly died, who t- became sin for us, who took the punishment of God for us on the cross? Don't you love him? Can't you see that he did this? to save a people, to reconcile them to God? Don't you love God the Father who would give his only son? Come on, friends. Come on, Corinthians. The love of Christ compels us. We want a world reconciled to God through Christ. You think about us, right? 2023, you look around, you imagine there's at the table with you, there's, there's your friend that you've been praying for, your family member that you dearly love. That person, you, you've seen them, you've seen, I can see what your great need is. You need your sins forgiven, reconciled to God. There they are, they're sitting next to you at the table. And you're, you're full of joy. You're full of thankfulness. And you're talking to each other, you're reflecting on what, what God has been doing amongst us. You know, what, what, what little changes would we go through to have that? Change the chairs and the tables for the sake of people being able to walk in, find a seat, hear the gospel, be loved, be reconciled to God. Well, compelled by love, we can do that, can't we? Come to church 15 minutes early to welcome people, you know, block out Sunday lunch to invite people out or invite people over. Take the first 15 minutes to, to, to get to know someone that we, we don't. Compelled by love? Yeah, we can do that. It raises the quality of what we do so that people are loved well as they walk in and experience warmth and care and hospitality and, you know, put in the preparation beforehand, reflect afterwards. Compelled by love? Yeah, we can do that. Pray for our three friends. Ask them that question this week. Just one of those friends, ask them that question that week. You know, why wouldn't you believe in... Sorry, I can't remember what the question is, Rick. What's your biggest doubt about Christianity? Christianity can't be true because... Sorry, we've done this a few times. I get confused. Well, I need to open my phone first, but compelled by love, we can do that, can't we? We can do that. Send out a church plant. We're compelled by love, we can do that. Grow, multiply congregations. Very hard. Compelled by love, we can do that. And I want to say, friends, that compelled by love, seeing clearly, it's already happening amongst us. God has answered so many prayers this year. It's why we've Seeing people come to know Jesus. So like five or six people become Christians this year so far. Yeah, it's, if you're sitting here today, you're exploring who Jesus is, you're a person who's loved and prayed for. Uh, you're probably sitting next to someone who, who knows you and cares about you, and the biggest thing they, they want for you in the world is that you'd be reconciled to God. They, they desperately want to talk about that with you in a moment. They might be feeling very awkward and not sure what to say. But they want that for you so much because they love you. Don't leave without talking to them. Find out what it means to be reconciled to God, to, to trust in Jesus. It's been happening. I think about like Clem and Ed. So often, I had, if you, if you, I'm not going to you, ask you to put your hands up, but so many of you have been over to their place for lunch. I've been out for lunch with them, haven't you? Oh, they, they've been a model amongst us of how to show generous hospitality. I'm not going to look at them. They're probably red as beet. 
Or you think about, I think about Chris and Cindy, who are leading, leading two of our music teams, and, and they've just rejigged how our teams work so that they spend so much more time getting together to prepare and practice and then reflect on how it's gone. This is hours of unseen work that they're doing. Various people who have slowed down to encourage each other to pray and have prayed for their friends, like our, our mission advocates in our small groups, who just encourage us again and again, let's, oh no, let's stop, we want to love our friends. We, we can't miss this moment, let's pray for them. We can't miss this moment. Keep doing these things all the more. Keep being a church compelled by the love that you've seen in Christ Jesus. His love, ours for Him. And do this by holding with crystal clarity these things that Paul has shown us. Our need for reconciliation, the death of Christ, the ministry of God to reconcile the world. Let me pray. Father, may our love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that we can discern what is best, to be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to your praise and glory. Give us that clarity, wisdom, courage, that we be and let us be compelled by love as we see these things. Continue to work out your good purposes amongst us. And we long for these good things, that we would be a church that grow in number as people are saved and reconciled to you, as people are loved because of Jesus Christ, because you are so lovely, praiseworthy, and good. And we all desperately need you. We ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.